It started as a simple way to share my experience of getting back into flying after an absence of 23 years. It evolved into the story of my journey to build and fly an experimental airplane, something I had never considered, by the way. Back in the late 70s through the early 90s, flying was a major part of my life. I was a somewhat accomplished pilot with over a thousand hours of pilot and command time. I hold a commercial pilot's license with instrument, single and multi-engine ratings, and a certified flight instructor certificate. These ratings, along with my logbook, had gathered a lot of dust in the 21st century. In fact, I opened my logbook about five years ago and I couldn't believe that the last entry was August of 93. I always knew that I would fly again someday, but after a 20 plus year hiatus, I sometimes wondered if I've still got what it takes. I never really stressed about the time frame. I figured, hey, I'm only in my mid 50s, I've got plenty of time. Well, life can really throw you a curve when you least expect it, and in late 2014, I was diagnosed with coronary artery disease that required immediate open heart surgery. I decided then and there that if I had a successful recovery, it was time to get back in the pilot seat. This is not where I planned to spend my Christmas holiday in 2014, but in retrospect, other than the true meaning of Christmas, it was probably the greatest Christmas gift I've ever received. I feel very blessed to say that all went well and I received a green light to resume normal life in early 2015. My first challenge would be to get my FAA medical certificate back. And just a footnote, if you have had open heart surgery, you're immediately grounded by the FAA. Now the fun process of proving yourself airworthy again to the FAA medical division in Oklahoma City. This took almost a year, but it was all worth it when my medical certificate was finally reinstated in February of 2016. Now I could concentrate on flying again. A lot had changed in the last 20 years. There were new airspace classifications, new regulations, significant changes to flight and navigation instruments, and of course, all the required physical skills of flying the airplane. Fortunately, all those years of flight instructing allowed me to come back up to speed pretty quickly. Another thing that helped was that I continued to read flying magazines during all those years away, so that helped to keep my aviation knowledge up to date. Only one small obstacle remained. I have to find an airplane to fly. The normal option is to join a flying club and rent an airplane, or, if you can afford it, buy your own. By the way, I had heard of these experimental home-built airplanes, but I didn't really consider them to be a legitimate option. They were probably built by mad scientist types and not especially airworthy. So back to the option of renting, it's always a compromise. You have very little control over the schedule or the mechanical condition of the plane. It's also quite expensive. A common single engine airplane can easily run $150 an hour to rent. Buying an airplane would be great, but if your budget goal is to stay under $100,000, you're somewhat limited to a 20 to 30 year old Piper or Cessna with a high number of hours on the airframe and engine. A certified airplane can also be expensive to maintain. Most of the work and all the legal inspections must be done by a certified airframe and power plant mechanic. As I continued my search for an airplane, I remembered a trip to Raleigh, North Carolina to visit some dear friends in September of 2013. One of the things that was on my bucket list was to visit Kitty Hawk, where the Wright brothers made that historic first flight. Well, our friends have a beach house not too far from Kitty Hawk, so they suggested we make the trip out there, then stay at the beach house for a few days. I was like a kid at Christmas. Great friends, Kitty Hawk, and a beach house? Let's go. As a pilot and lover of aviation, spending several hours at Kitty Hawk had me in awe. It was hard to get rid of the goosebumps as I walked along the stretch of sand and grass that was their runway. A couple years later, I received a copy of a new biography by David McCullough called The Wright Brothers. After reading this book, which was shortly after my heart surgery, I was so inspired, I had no idea what they had to endure to see their dream come true. The setbacks and frustration they were able to overcome is amazing. They never gave up. Their persistence and attitude were just so impressive and inspiring. So if you think about it, they were the first experimental home builders. What an honor it would be to follow in their footsteps just a little. 
As I began to seriously investigate the world of experimental aircraft, I started to realize there were some very attractive options out there. These were real, legal airplanes with airworthiness certificates issued by the FAA. Some of them were quite comfortable, had great performance numbers, and state-of-the-art avionics. I also realized that for about the same price of an old, high-time Cessna or Piper, I could have a new airplane with zero hours on the airframe and engine. You just get a lot more for your money if you can build it yourself. Another great benefit of an experimental is that the builder can be certified by the FAA to perform all the maintenance and legal inspections themselves. There are several companies out there that offer plans and kits for building an experimental airplane, but there was one company that I kept coming back to. The more I would read, the more impressed I became. This company is called Vans Aircraft in Aurora, Oregon. The company was founded in 1973 by Richard Van Groensven, who goes by the nickname Van, and all models start with, let with the letters RV, which are the founder's initials. They are very well respected around the world. Vans designs high-performance single-engine airplanes that are fun to fly. First, they design and build a prototype to meet a certain mission profile, then perfect it to the point that it's a viable airplane. Once the new models announced, they will sell you a set of plans and all the materials to build the plane yourself. They have an excellent reputation for customer service and support, and they've been around for almost 50 years. Vance has several different models to choose from, and I spent many hours trying to decide which model to build. Finally, I decided on the RV-12. It seemed to have the best overall combination of performance, economy, and build time. The RV-12 averages a build time of about 800 to 1200 hours. The RV-12 is a two-place side-by-side airplane with tricycle landing gear. It's powered by a 100 horsepower Rotax engine. It'll cruise at approximately 115 knots, which is about 138 miles an hour, and it only burns 4.5 gallons an hour. The Rotax engine will run on premium unleaded auto gas, which is significantly less expensive than 100 low-lead aviation fuel. The Dynon Skyview avionics package is comparable to what the major airlines are using, and it has a very capable two-axis autopilot. By the way, the RV-12 is the only model that you can purchase from Vans as a brand new, complete, and ready-to-fly airplane. The cost is about $140,000 for a new RV-12, but if you can build it yourself, that same airplane will cost you about $85,000. That's a significant savings for building it yourself, but just as valuable is that you'll know everything about your airplane. The RV-12 is sold in six kits. The first kit is called the empennage, which includes the tail cone, the horizontal and vertical stabilizers, and associated control surfaces and hardware. It's basically the last third of the airplane. You learn most of the basic construction skills while building the empennage. For most people, kit number two is the wing kit, followed by kit number three, the fuselage kit. I found this kit to be the most time-consuming of all the kits, primarily because of all the nut plates that have to be installed. Kit number four is called the finishing kit, which included the landing gear, the canopy, fuel tank, and seats. This is normally followed by kit five, the avionics. Finally, you'll be ready for the power plant kit, which includes the Rotax 912 ULS engine, the Sensenich two-blade composite propeller, and all associated hardware. Before I got too carried away, I decided I wanted to meet a few RV-12 builders and, if possible, see their airplanes in person. Using the FAA's aircraft registry, I tracked down some owner builders and introduced myself. I must say that this experimental community is made up of some amazing people. Everyone I met was extremely generous with their time and just really great guys. Getting to see several completed RV-12s up close and personal was invaluable, and I was even allowed to fly a couple of them. It's time to get busy converting my garage into an airplane workshop. This was a little difficult for me because my garage was very clean and organized with an indoor parking space for every car, truck, and motorcycle. I had to move some things around to make room for the new project. My truck and my wife's car would have to move to the driveway, and my car lift and motorcycle lift would become temporary airplane workbenches. The average build duration was about three years, 
but I had a very aggressive plan to complete the plane in one year so I could reclaim my garage. The decision was made, and with the support of my wife, it was time to place my order for the first kit. There was about an eight-week lead time for the kit to be ready, so I had time to order all my specialty tools and get the garage in airplane mode. I already had a nice inventory of power tools and hand tools, but building an airplane requires more than that. It was about a $2,000 investment in tools, primarily for doing all types of riveting and working with aluminum and fiberglass. Since I live in Northern California, which is approximately 600 miles from Aurora, Oregon, I decided I would drive my truck up to Vans and pick up my first kit in person. This would give me an opportunity to tour the factory, meet some employees, and even get a chance to fly their demo RV-12. I had a very nice tour of the office and factory. It ended up being a personal tour with one of their employees named Ken. We finished in the large hangar where they keep all their demo models. Ken and I had just finished my demo flight in their RV-12 and were putting the plane back in the hangar when founder and CEO Dick Van Groensven walked through the hangar door. Ken introduced me to Van as a new RV-12 customer. We had a great talk. Van is just what I expected, a really nice guy. We took a photo together and off he went while I pulled my truck up to their loading dock to take my first kit home. This was a very exciting start to an amazing journey. It's Tuesday, March 8, 2016. I just got home from a long 10-hour drive from Vans Aircraft in Aurora, Oregon. I backed my truck into the garage, and the empennage kit is still in the bed. I've got a lot of work to do. I have to inventory the kit and start construction. It's pretty late at night, so I'll probably start tomorrow. My goal is to complete the airplane in the next year, so that would put me sometime around March 2017. Well, I enlisted the help of my wife, and we started unpacking the empennage kit. Then it was time for inventory. This is a pretty daunting task. There are what seems like thousands of part numbers, and they just keep going and going and going. It's very important that you make sure every kit is complete. One of the boxes I opened was all the rivets for the airframe over the entire project. When you open that box and you see 12,500 rivets, it's a pretty sobering sight. You kind of feel like, I'll never get through all those. But you start one rivet at a time and it's amazing how the progress goes. One of the other challenges is you have to try to lay out all the parts onto shelves or in some sort of order so you can know how to find them when you get to that step in the plans. Okay. After three months of planning, preparing the garage, building workbenches, buying tools, it's finally time to start building the plane. I'm excited. The first major assembly to build is the vertical stabilizer. This is a critical part of the airframe and I can't wait to start. Hmm, wait a minute. Why are the first assembly steps in section 6 of the kit assembly instructions? What about sections 1 through 5? Well, it turns out that sections 1 through 5 contain tons of reference material that will be needed to build the plane. Things like how to build electrical connectors, build fuel and brake lines, aviation grade hardware specifications, rivets, nut plates. So much to learn over the next year or so. Here's a list of the blind or pulled rivets you'll be working with. Pay attention to the LP4-3 outlined in red you will become an expert with this rivet. In the first kit, you'll receive a box of about 12,500 LP4-3 rivets. By the time the plane is finished, you'll only have a few left. You'll also work with just as many different types of solid or squeezed rivets. Then there are the nut plates. By the time you finish the fuselage, you'll feel like you've installed thousands of nut plates, which you probably have. Now on to the first real step of building. You're fabricating hinge brackets for the rudder to attach to the vertical stabilizer. You will be using a bandsaw daily to separate one large part into multiple parts. Here you take two halves of a hinge bracket, add a spacer and a bearing, then rivet it all together with solid rivets. These are the first components that you'll build. This also lets you know that you'll be making almost everything from raw materials, even something as simple as a bracket with a bearing inside. Here I'm building the skeleton for the vertical stabilizer from a main spar and ribs. 
Then the assembly will be covered with an aluminum skin. Those small copper posts are called clecos. They're like temporary rivets and hold the parts together for final riveting. This was a great feeling. Just four days after getting my first kit home, I had a completed airplane part. You also realize why aluminum riveted airplane construction has been around over a hundred years. That entire assembly was super light, yet incredibly strong. Building the rudder is similar to the vertical stabilizer. Then it's on to building the bulkheads for the tail cone. The bulkheads seem a little flimsy until you start riveting on the skins. The tail cone skins are a little awkward to work with because they're long and tapered. Finally, the tail cone starts to take shape and becomes a strong, lightweight structure. Now it's on to the main spar box and ribs of the stabilator. The stabilator is a combination of the horizontal stabilizer and the elevator. Once the stabilator and the anti-servo tabs were complete, it was time to attach them to the tail cone along with a vertical stabilizer and rudder. The tail cone was basically complete in about six weeks. Hopefully I'm on schedule. The problem is that the completed tail cone takes up a huge area of my garage workshop. My wife to the rescue as she offers to let me store it in the formal living room for a few months. This ends up not being an issue since we use the family room most of the time anyway. Besides, it was a great conversation piece when you walk through the front door. With the empennage nearing completion, it was time to order the next kit. I tried to plan my order so that I could continue building without any long interruptions. The wing kit currently had a 10 week lead time, but I could get the fuselage in just a couple weeks. So I ordered the fuselage kit and the wing kit at the same time. I figured that would give me about 10 weeks to finish the fuselage, then the wing kit would arrive. It turns out that I needed all that and a little more. I spent about three straight months working on the fuselage. The wings and fuselage are really not sequence sensitive, so you can build either kit after the empennage. I started on the fuselage in May of 2016. Wow, I thought the empennage was hard to inventory. The fuselage kit must have taken two to three days just to inventory and organize all the parts. And the parts were getting much more interesting. It was fun to imagine what some of these raw materials would become. It had to be substantial if all these pieces would someday be a functioning fuselage. By the way, the blue coating you see on all the aluminum parts is just a protective coating from the factory. I prefer to peel it off when starting to work with the part, but you could also leave it on until you're finished. It's up to the builder. Here, working with the center section, I had to match drill 73 holes through the heavy aluminum plate. The center section is the part that the wings will eventually attach to. The entire remainder of the airplane will be slowly added to this center section. After about a month of hard work, the center section starts to look like this. You can see all the ribs and cross members that have been added. This is the bottom view with the fuselage on its side. This is the main control column that runs under the pilot and passenger seats. The control sticks, stabilator cables, and flaperon control rods will connect to this column. Now it's time to prepare the quarter panel side skins and bottom skins for riveting. You use a ton of clecos here to try and get everything in perfect alignment before starting the rivets. If all goes well, it should look something like this. The oval holes on the right are inspection panels for access to the critical areas of the center section and center tunnel. Here, I've built the lower front foot well. This is where the rudder and brake pedals will go. Then it will be riveted onto the front of this fuselage section. The fuselage is really starting to take shape. My neighbors still think I'm building a boat, but that's okay. I know it's an airplane. At this point, it's still a luxury to be able to tip the fuselage on its side. To have that access to the center tunnel is invaluable. This is where you have to run the fuel and brake lines along with the main wiring harness. This step was fun and scary at the same time, drilling and assembling the rudder and brake pedals. 
This was a good time to paint the interior of the fuselage. Working with bright overhead lighting and all that shiny aluminum was a little blinding. It was much nicer to continue work after it was painted. Seeing this picture of preparing and test fitting the right fuselage side skin reminds me of one of my least favorite steps in building the fuselage, the bending of the longerons. The longerons are important, they provide the main mid-lateral support for the left and right sides of the fuselage. It started simple enough. Here they are on the fuselage inventory sheet. It looks so innocent, just two pieces of approximately 8 foot long heavy aluminum angle. I inspect them during inventory and I'm happy. They look perfectly straight. The problem is that you need to bend and twist them in a very precise way using very non-precision tools like a hammer and a vise. It's just one page in the building instructions, but as you start to look at the detailed steps, you realize what you're in for. I spent a full weekend making these longerons. They want you to open up the 90 degree angle on one end to 95.4 degrees and then have it taper back to 90 degrees in the first 12 and 11 16 inches. Then twist it 2.7 degrees so the top is level for the full 82 and 3 8 inches. Now put it in a vise and bend it in a complex curve using the provided template. After 8 hours of frustration, if you get it right, your reward is to make another one for the other side in a mirror image. I found myself mumbling about this process many times over the weekend. Why in the world didn't they make these in a form or mold at the factory so they would be perfect and save all the drama of beating these things with a hammer all day long? By the way, if you order an RV-12 fuselage kit today, the longerons come pre-formed. Sometimes it pays to procrastinate. It's been about three months and the fuselage is almost complete. Here you can see the rudder and brake pedals, the avionics shelf and upper firewall. All the fuel and brake lines are installed and tested. Here's a good view of the upper and lower firewall from the front. The battery box and the oil tank holder are in place. That bright blue assembly at the bottom of the firewall is called the gascolator. The main fuel line from the tank will connect here. This is the low point in the system where you can capture and drain water or sediment. I'm happy to put the fuselage away for now. The wing kit has been delivered and I'm pretty excited to start building them. It still looks a little like a boat. My goal to finish the wings is going to be about a month. It's going to add some time because I've ordered the optional lighting kit. So we'll see how that goes. It's late summer of 2016 and the wing kit has been delivered. A couple of very interesting crates are in the garage. One contains all the wing skins along with various spars and ribs. The other crate is approximately 12 inches by 12 inches but 16 feet long. This box contains the left and right main wing spars. The main wing spars are impressive, obviously very strong and sturdy, and each one is 16 feet long. The RV-12 has a wingspan of about 27 feet, so they have about 3 feet of overlap where they connect to the center section of the fuselage. Each wing has 14 nose ribs and 13 main ribs along with the front and rear spar. One of the most time-consuming tasks is to deburr the edges of all these aluminum parts. It's not uncommon to spend about 15 minutes working with each rib just to get them ready for installation. Here I'm test fitting the first wing skin. Each wing has nine skins to cover the complete structure. All the wing skins must also be deburred. This is a picture of the micro switch for the stall warning alarm. It needs to be installed and wired in the left leading edge. This is the electrical connector that mates to the fuselage connector. This connection supports all the electrical equipment in the wing. The wings probably get the overall majority of all the rivets. You spend hours and hours riveting the wings. Here's my wife, Bonnie, installing a few rivets in the wing. I joked with her that now if something went wrong, I'd have someone to blame. 
but in reality, I just wanted her to be a part of it. All the wiring runs through bushings from rib to rib, and each wing at the root gets a doubler plate for extra strength. If you want to be legal to fly at night, you need to order the optional lighting kit. This will get you a taxi and landing light, red and green position lights, and anti-collision wingtip strobes. In this photo, I'm starting the installation of the lighting. It's really hard to start drilling massive holes in the beautiful leading edge of the right wing. Kind of like the adage, you have to break some eggs if you want to make an omelet. You use a template to carefully mark the cutout for the landing light. I chose to drill some large holes with a unibit to assist in cutting out the large rectangle on the tightly curved surface. Then you rivet in a couple additional ribs to support the landing light structure. Ultimately, it gets covered with a curved plexiglass lens. For the wingtip lighting, you have to make fiberglass wingtip extensions that the light fixture can attach to. I was surprised at how many electrical connectors you actually have to create over the course of the build. But the electrical schematic is excellent and if you have the right tools, it's not a big deal. You need to pay attention when installing the wingtip light fixtures. They look identical but are two different part numbers. The green light goes on the right wingtip, the red on the left. This is a standard in aviation, so at night you can tell if an airplane is coming toward you or going away from you by the position of the red and green lights. Now that the wings are complete, it's time to build the flapperons. This is a very nice design that combines the functions of the flaps and ailerons into one long control surface on the trailing edge of each wing. It's a fairly complex mechanical design to make the flapperons deploy symmetrically as flaps and move asymmetrically as ailerons. I remember building something called the flapperon mixer assembly during the fuselage construction and wondering what the heck is this going to do? But you build on according to the plans knowing that it will make sense later. In this picture the mixer box is connected to the mixer bell crank and that's where all the mechanical magic happens. Making the flapperons was like building two additional wings. They were long and narrow with the leading and trailing edge just like any airfoil. They had heavy counterweighting on the outboard end that was provided by a large section of stainless steel pipe inside the leading edge. Here's the completed left wing, electrical and flight controls intact, ready to install into the fuselage. This is a small milestone, the first time a wing was locked in place on the fuselage. You definitely get inspired by these small victories. Now that the wings are complete, I can store them in my wing rack. Thanks to my son James for helping me build it. This is very handy to have because you will only need to install the wings a couple times before the first flight. You want them safely out of the way, clear of all the building mayhem that's yet to come. In late July of 2016, as I was building the wings, I realized that I better check on the availability of the next kit, called the Finish Kit. According to Van's website, there was an 8-10 to 10 week wait. This caught me by surprise and I ordered the finish kit right away. I finished the wings near the end of August and now had to wait one month for the arrival of the finish kit. This was difficult. I had spent every spare moment of the last six months building. In retrospect, it was probably a very welcome break. I think I had mowed our lawns once in the last six months. I'm pretty sure I was still taking showers so it's not healthy to become too obsessed with any project. When the finish kit arrived at the end of September 2016, I was refreshed and ready to go. When I opened the massive shipping crate, it was like my best Christmas morning ever. The finish kit is very exciting. It literally contains everything you need to finish the airplane, less the engine and avionics, but you don't see those from the outside anyway. You get the seats, the interior panels, the carpeting, then there are the wheels and tires, the brakes, the landing gear, the canopy frame and plexiglass bubble, the rear window, the fuel tank, the control sticks and flight control cables, the engine cowling. I was so excited I wanted to install everything at once. Of course, you have to step back and resume normal construction per the plans. 
your imagination is running wild, so excited that when the finish kit is complete, it will look like a full-blown airplane sitting on its own landing gear, never again to be mistaken as a boat. Well, the name finishing kit can be a little misleading. Yes, it is the finish kit, but it takes a long time to finish. I worked on this for the rest of 2016. You start with the main wiring harness, followed by the options wiring harness. These run from the avionics shelf and snake down into the center tunnel, then route to every extremity of the airframe. It's super time consuming and the center tunnel access gets very tight. The fuel lines and brake lines, along with control rods, valves, the fuel pump, the fuel flow transducer, are all taking up a lot of space in the tunnel already. You have to be very organized to get all the wiring nicely laid out and be sure nothing is chafing or rubbing. Once all the difficult wiring is completed in Section 31, you are rewarded with Section 32, the flight controls. This is pretty exciting. You're going to install the control sticks, connect the flapper on controls, which include the push rods, torque arms, and torque tubes, install the flap handle, run the rudder cables and stabilator cables back to the tail cone. Oh, by the way, the tail cone is still sitting in the living room. I'll have to move the tail cone into the garage and rivet it to the fuselage first. Can't wait to see those pieces connected. This is going to be a fun section. These white pieces are the flapperon torque arms. When you move the control stick left and right, these rotate in opposite directions. They will be connected to the flapperon torque tubes, which connect directly to the flapperons on the wings. This is how the airplane rolls, or banks. The small servo motor at the bottom center of the photo is the roll servo. I installed it as part of the autopilot feature. There will be a short control rod that connects this motor to one of the flapperon torque arms, thereby allowing the motor to also control banking the airplane under autopilot control. The next step is to install the torque tubes into the arms and drill them. This requires that the wings are both installed at the same time, so this will have to be done outside. Wing installation is definitely a two-person job, so I called Eric, my best friend from high school, to see if he could help. Like a true friend, he said he would come over and help with the plane anytime I needed him. We set the fuselage on a table in the street, then rolled the wings out on the wing rack. Because of the way the wing spars overlap, you must install the left wing first, then the right. Since the fuselage is not yet on its landing gear, we put a support under the left wing to keep it stable while we installed the right wing. Once the wings were installed, I was able to drill the flapper on torque tubes from the rear. Here, I'm working on the flight controls. I won't have this kind of access much longer. So, the tail cone has been moved to the garage and clecoed to the fuselage. I have the airframe off the ground for the landing gear installation. I'm still preparing the nose wheel fork and nose wheel. Should be able to roll on its own soon. I'm continuing to prepare the tail cone for final riveting to the fuselage. You can find yourself in some pretty awkward positions when working back in the tail cone now. Well, boys will be boys, and it's fun to pretend when nobody's looking. The control sticks are installed, and the stabilator and rudder cables are connected. Fully operational flight controls at this point. The RV-12 has full dual controls, so you can fly it from either side. The very small button on top of each control stick is the push-to-talk switch for the communication radio. Here you can see the pitot and static lines connected to the black box at the top of the tail cone. You can also see the rudder and stabilator cables going back through the aft tail cone bulkhead where they connect to the rudder and stabilator. This is the far aft tail cone bulkhead with the stabilator currently removed. This is where the rudder and stabilator cables will exit the tail cone and connect to their control surfaces. This will all get protected by a tail cone fairing that still has to be built. Now with the rudder and stabilator installed and the tail cone fairing in place. Here's what it looks like inside the tail cone fairing from the rear of the plane. 
The stabilator and rudder cables are attached and their cotter pins are in place on the castle nuts. I took a quick break from all the difficult work and played with the interior for a couple hours. It was great to see what it would look like. I upgraded the interior so I have all leather seats and interior panels and a very nice carpet for all the floor surfaces. Okay, back to real work. Wow, now it's time for the canopy. It looks simple enough, but the canopy work goes on for weeks. You start with a simple metal frame, and by the time you're done with the fiberglass canopy fairing, you spend about a hundred hours of busy work. I think the canopy and the fuel tank, more on that later, were the two most difficult parts of the entire build. You have to drill about 60 holes around the perimeter of your expensive and easily damaged plexiglass bubble. You actually rivet the front of the bubble to the front bar of the canopy frame. Anyway, it's just an amazing amount of work, but it can come out very nice. The worst part for me was doing the fiberglass layup to create the canopy fairing. I had never worked with fiberglass cloth and resins before. A huge thanks to my friend Randy for helping me get through the fiberglass fairing. Okay, now it's on to the fuel tank. This was another huge challenge, but again, just follow the plans and do your best. By the way, Vans offered to send you a completed and tested fuel tank when you ordered your finish kit for an extra $450. I declined since most builders that I talked to built theirs themselves. I knew that if the tank ever leaked or had a problem, it would be a lot easier to fix it if I had built it. I'm glad I did it myself, but it was not fun. The key to this aluminum tank, being air and liquid tight, is the sealant that you use. They call it Pro Seal, and you mix it yourself shortly before each use. It's a two-part sealant, it smells bad and is difficult to work with. It has a shelf life, so you want a fairly fresh batch when you're starting the fuel tank construction. You only mix a small amount at a time, because you can only work with it for about an hour before it starts to cure. The process is awkward. You take sheets and miscellaneous parts made of aluminum, then you scuff them up so the sealant will adhere to the surface, then spread the sealant between the parts and rivet them together. You dip each rivet in the sealant before inserting it, which tends to make a mess everywhere. During construction, I had a zero confidence level that this tank would not leak. It took me a couple weeks of work sessions to complete the tank. Then you let it cure for another week or so before testing it. To my amazement, it had no leaks at all. It actually came out looking pretty good, too, even though it will be covered by the carpet kit eventually. The last major section of the finish kit is the cowling. I've done some of the initial trimming, but most Vans insiders say it's best to wait until you have the engine and propeller installed because you won't really be able to fit the cowling properly until then. It's early November 2016 and my avionics kit has been delivered. The system I ordered is the Dynon Skyview Touch. It includes a 10 inch touchscreen electronic flight information system or EFIS with moving map, synthetic vision, an advanced engine management system, autopilot with flight director, GPS mode S transponder with ADS-B in and out, and a Garmin comm radio. Just a footnote, ADS-B is an amazing new technology. When combined with GPS, it allows the pilot to see traffic and weather on their moving map display. This was impossible when I stopped flying in the early 90s. I'm really excited to get this installed in my panel. Unfortunately, I won't be able to test the system until I get the engine kit because I don't have a battery or electrical system yet. I couldn't wait, I just had to set it into my panel and see what it looked like. Now it's time to open up the avionics shelf and start installing all the cabling and equipment. The avionics shelf is filling up quickly as I continue to mount all the new boxes and cables. The Dynon system has a special control module that everything gets connected to. I have all the new avionics installed and that is about as far as I can go. It's Thanksgiving 2016 and I'm at a standstill until I can order the power plant kit which will get me the Rotax engine, the propeller, and my electrical system. 
I've spent all that I can on the plane for this year, so the engine's going to have to wait until sometime in 2017. A quick side note for married people. In a good marriage, you pool your resources and make financial decisions together for the good of your family. Each person should have a little of their own discretionary money for something fun or personal, and my account was definitely depleted for the year. Somewhere around the 1st of December, Bonnie surprised me and told me that I was getting the engine for Christmas. Wow. I know for a fact there are several things she would have loved to do with that much money, but instead, she chose to spend it on my dream. That's something I will never forget. Still in somewhat of a state of shock, I had to pinch myself and then start planning for the engine installation. On December 5, 2016, two days before our 31st wedding anniversary, the engine was delivered and I was back in business. Uncrating the new engine was awesome. The Rotax 912 is an amazing little motor. I used an engine hoist to carefully lift it out of the crate and set it on a work table. There were several days of work to do before actually bolting it to the engine mounts on the firewall. As I was still unpacking the main crate that includes all the peripheral components to support the engine, another box caught my eye. The propeller. Let's face it, the engine and airframe are great, but without the propeller, it would just sit there and make noise. I grabbed the long Sensenich box to lift it out of the crate and was immediately surprised. I thought to myself, it's empty. There was no way that two propeller blades were inside. To that point in my life, my only experience with props is that they were made out of wood or metal. This new prop was made out of carbon fiber, and sure enough, both blades were inside the box. I didn't take the time to weigh them, but to me, they were almost weightless. Amazing that they can be so strong, and it makes you really appreciate the advantage of building things out of composites today. Before installing the engine, propeller, and cowling, I need to finish the install of my Dynon Avionics. The Skyview system provides all the engine management functions, so this must be operational before you even think about starting the engine for the first time. The wiring starts to get pretty crazy and you continue to build and add connectors. When it's complete, I installed lots of cable ties and cleaned everything up. I can't stand troubleshooting electrical problems with a rat's nest of wires. The panel is really starting to come together. All the fuses and switches are in. I cut the panel holes for the optional knob modules at the top center of the panel. I built and installed the little map box. There's an option for a second Skyview display on the right side of the panel, but I opted for using an iPad mini with an amazing app called ForeFlight. It will be RAM mounted on the right between the map box and the center panel. This actually gives you a nice level of redundancy if your entire panel fails. The standard instrument panel that Vance provides comes in three sections made from heavy aluminum plate. I wanted to dress it up a little, so I found a company up in Washington State that does custom carbon fiber panels. They're about 5 millimeters thick with adhesive on the back, so you can apply them right over the stock panels. It's a very nice look. Now that the avionics installation is complete and I have an electrical system, actually just the battery, no engine or alternator installed yet, I can perform the initial smoke test on my Skyview. So I triple check all my connections, then power it up for the first time. Wow, it's beautiful. Okay, maybe that's a stretch, but I can't believe that I'm sitting in the cockpit in my garage and playing with this amazing system. It was fun to do some direct routes from my house to Los Angeles, New York, and Oshkosh. If you don't get the Oshkosh reference, it's kind of like heaven to experimental aircraft. Here I am on November 5th, 2016. I call this wishful thinking because I had no clear plan to acquire the engine, but it was fun to validate that my engine hoist would work fine when the time comes. Now fast forward just six weeks and it's real. Now it's time to get serious about hanging the engine. I have a couple days of prep work on the firewall and I have to install the engine mounts. I have an engine hoist that will easily suspend the Rotax and allow me to roll it into position. I could probably do it myself, but I decided it was better to call Eric back to have another set of hands and eyes that I trusted. 
Before actually installing the engine, there's a lot of final prep at the firewall while you still have easy access. Here, all the engine management wires are routed and prepared for the engine. Within a couple hours, Eric and I had the engine installed. Add a propeller and this thing just might fly. The prop install, along with its fiberglass spinner, was next on the agenda. It was several days of work to get the propeller blades adjusted to their perfect 71.4 degree pitch and create the spinner assembly. Another challenge of this prop spinner install is that the pitot tube, which is a critical component for measuring your airspeed, actually runs through the engine compartment and comes out through the middle of the spinner. On most single-engine propeller-driven airplanes, the pitot tube is out on the leading edge of one of the wings. This just adds some complexity to the prop spinner install. Most of this engine and propeller work was completed over the Christmas holiday, plus I normally take a couple of weeks of vacation in December. This also allowed me to install the muffler, oil tank, oil cooler and coolant radiators, and the coolant expansion tank. Another exciting part of the engine work was installing the throttle and choke cables. These route from the center of the panel through the firewall and connect to the left and right carburetors. That's pretty exciting, a throttle inside the cockpit to actually control the engine. What a concept. This was absolutely one of my favorite Christmas seasons ever. Now that the engine and propeller spinner are in place, I could get down to the serious work on the main cowling. There is just no way around it. To get the cowling to fit nicely around the engine was a couple weeks of work. It's now January 2017 and I'm busy working on the cowling. This is a complex and time-consuming operation. The cowlings are attached to the fuselage and to each other by a series of long piano hinges. They're not used as a typical hinge where something swings open or closed. Instead, they're used as fasteners. You take the hinge apart, drill a series of holes, then rivet one side of the hinge to each piece you want to fasten together. It's critical that you mark and drill the hinges in perfect alignment on both pieces because if you're off just a little, once you rivet the hinges in place, the hinge pins will never go in. There are so many edges that need to line up perfectly when you're finished. To make it more difficult, you're not dealing with flat pieces. The upper and lower cowlings have many curved edges. After several weeks of cutting, fitting, filing, sanding, drilling and riveting, you should have a pretty good fit. You also need to cut an opening in the upper cowl and install an access door for checking the oil and coolant levels. The depth of the cowling is also critical because you need just the right gap between the front face of the cowling and the propeller spinner. You want to make sure you have an acceptable gap because that fiberglass spinner could be turning up to 2400 RPM. But you certainly don't want too large a gap, it could be very bad if anything got in there. For a little additional cowling frustration, you have to use resin and some glass cloth to glass in a large tunnel which will direct cooling air from the main opening in the lower cowl to the oil cooler and radiator. This tunnel makes a very tight fit against both radiators which makes it even more of a challenge to get all your hinge pins to line up when you reinstall the cowlings. After the tunnel is finished, you install heat shield material to the inside of the lower cowling to protect it from the heat of the exhaust and muffler. Wow, the cowling was just a lot of work and I was super happy when it was finished. It's just one of those steps that's not fun, but very important. It's January 15th, 2017 and I'm ready to do a static test of the flight controls. I've asked my friend Rob to come over and give me a hand installing the wings. He wanted to see the plane and I really need his help, so it's a win-win for sure. This is the first time the plane has been completely assembled, wings attached and standing on its landing gear. Also a nice time for a couple pictures, then back to work. This is also the first time the flaperons have been connected to the control stick. The control cables for the rudder and stabilator are installed and tensioned correctly. As I sit in the plane outside, all controls move smoothly and have the correct range of motion. It's really great to have it outside and the basic assembly complete. One of my final tasks on the airframe is to install the rear window. I think I'm just about ready for my first engine start. 
nervous and excited. This was a significant step, putting fuel in the tank for the first time. I put in about 5 gallons of Chevron Supreme Unleaded 91 Octane. I did an ethanol test on the Chevron Supreme and I measured 5% ethanol. Rotax approves up to 10% ethanol, or E10, so the Chevron seems very good. I will monitor the fuel system very closely. There should be no leaks, but this will prove it one way or the other. It's February 24th, 2017, and I'm ready for my first engine run. I've asked my dear old friend Gary to assist. He's super analytical and he loves airplanes, a perfect assistant for this test. This was by far my biggest milestone yet. So many things will finally be tested for the first time. Mainly the quality of the engine install, but also the fuel system, the brakes, the oil and coolant systems, the propeller and spinner, the throttle and choke, the Dynon Skyview, primarily the engine management portion, and my communications radio. My plan is to give Gary my handheld transceiver, and I'll use my headset and comm radio in the plane so we can communicate over the engine noise. I'm happy to report the first engine run was a great success. It fired up immediately, the throttle was smooth, and I ran it for 22 minutes between 2,000 and 4,000 RPM. The fuel and oil pressures were good. Oil, cylinder head, and exhaust gas temps were all in the green. The prop seemed well balanced and the engine ran very smooth. The battery and alternator looked great. There were no signs of any fuel leaks at all. As I ran the engine up to 4,000 RPM, the brakes did a great job of keeping the airplane in place. All the new engine sensors are working great. The radio worked great too. I would say it's time to celebrate. Thanks for the help, Gary. It's early March 2017 and things are happening fast after the first engine run. I've secured a hangar at Lodi Airport because this little RV-12 is going to need a runway in the next few months. Can't even believe I'm saying that. It's not the Taj Mahal of hangars, it was built in the 40s, but it'll do fine. Lodi's a nice little airport and it's only 5 miles from home. Now that the airplane is somewhat complete, I decided to prime all the fiberglass parts. I was not a fan of the translucent lime green look. I just picked an aviation gray primer color to somewhat go with the natural aluminum. It'll probably be a year or so until I can have the plane painted. I have to keep the plane at my house in Galt until the airworthiness inspection is complete. The FAA inspector is from the Sacramento District Office and Galt is in Sacramento County. If I move the plane to Lodi Airport, I would have to find another inspector because Lodi is in San Joaquin County. My inspection date is April 13th. I have a lot to do in the next month. It's March 13th, 2017, and I need to run the engine and do some real taxi tests with the airplane completely assembled. I live on a court and my neighbors have given me the green light to taxi around the neighborhood. I've explained the danger of a spinning propeller to children and animals, and all necessary precautions have been taken. I've asked my friend Eric to come back and assist with wing installation, video recording, and be a little bit of a safety monitor. The testing today was a huge success. I ran the engine for about 45 minutes with no issues at all. Everything on the engine management side was good. The engine felt smooth and strong. The brakes were very responsive as I taxied in the court and I got to sample a little of the rudder effectiveness for taxiing. It felt ready to fly but I still have a lot to do before my airworthiness inspection. The inspection is coming up fast and I still need to calculate the empty weight and center of gravity for the RV-12. Gary's coming over to help. I purchased three scales from Amazon and we should be ready to go. We needed level ground where both wings could be attached, so we rolled the fuselage to a strategic location in my backyard, then installed the wings. We had a good time and it was a great learning process. Once I had the empty weight and balance numbers, I could complete the worksheets for the inspector. 
Here's a picture of Gary holding the right wheel off the ground so I could place one of the scales. By the way, the empty weight was 741.3 pounds and the center of gravity was 81.38 inches aft of datum. Not that anyone cares. Well, today's the big day. It's April 13th, 2017, and the airworthiness inspector will be here this morning. I've spent the last week going over every rivet, nut and bolt, cotter pin, safety wire, and cable clamp. I've checked the wheels, the tires, the brakes, the flight controls. The plane is ready, and I'm ready. It's been 13 months since I first unpacked that empennage crate. It's one of those things that seems like only yesterday and seems like an eternity at the same time. The inspector spent four hours going over the plane today and... It passed. It's now a legal airworthy airplane and we are moving to the airport. The milestones are coming fast and furious now. It's April 20th and Gary and Eric are coming over to help me move the RV-12 to my hangar. I've borrowed a flatbed trailer that I can pull with my truck. The trailer will handle the fuselage. The wings are removed and I'll make a second trip to bring them back in the wing rack. It takes quite a while to secure the airplane to the trailer. It's a good thing we only have a short distance to go. We can take back roads and stay off the highway. After we get the plane unloaded, we drop off the trailer and come back to my house to load the rack and wings in the back of my truck. It was a little crazy, but everything made it safely. By the time we got everything unloaded and the wings reinstalled, it was late. A job well done. What a great day. A huge thanks to Eric and Gary. I could not have done it without them. We're going to close up the hangar and I'm taking them to dinner. It's May 5th, 2017. Hopefully not a day that will live in infamy. It is Cinco de Mayo, but I'm of German heritage, so I don't think that's going to help. I've had the airplane here at the airport for a couple weeks. I've continued running tests, including a few high-speed taxi tests on the runway, and I can't think of any reasons to delay the first flight. I'm excited and prepared, but also just a little nervous. One thing I've never done in my flying career is to be a test pilot. Many builders hire a professional test pilot for the first flight, but there's no way I could do that. I feel that it's my responsibility and my privilege. I passed my FAA flight review in January. I have insurance and I have my medical certificate. And excellent life insurance, but I really don't want to dwell on that one. And thanks to a couple of great guys named Nick and Stan at SAC Exec Airport, I have five hours of recent RV-12 time in my logbook. I didn't want any fanfare today. I had a million things already on my mind, and I was trying so hard to focus on the task at hand. My entire ground crew consisted of my wife and Gary. They were a quiet, calming, and positive influence that morning, which is exactly what I needed. To be philosophical for a moment, it's rare in life to be faced with a single task that, if successful, has this incredible euphoric upside. But if not, a potentially sad and tragic downside. Once you commit to takeoff, this is one of those moments. As I performed the pre-flight inspection, I tried to view this as any other flight. I was totally focused on what I had to do once I was in the air. My experimental airplane had an FAA required five hours of flight testing. This is called phase one and per my operating limitations, it must be done during the day in visual flight conditions within 25 miles of my home airport. My flight plan today called for about 45 minutes of testing. You really just want to get the feel of the airplane. I would plan to fly straight ahead at best rate of climb speed from sea level to around 3,000 feet. During the climb, carefully monitor the engine and all fuel, oil, and cooling indicators. Once level, start a series of shallow turns, followed by some standard rate turns, which is 3 degrees per second. Then fly at lower speeds to get the feel of the airplane at minimum controllable airspeed, followed by a couple power-off stalls. 
This is really important. It should be docile and predictable in this region of flight. Since this plane has never flown before, you want to verify this at a safe altitude. That way you can be exactly sure what to expect that first time you slow the plane for landing. thank my parents. Flying was in my blood. Both my mom and dad were licensed pilots. Although I really didn't have a relationship with my dad, after he retired as an Air Force pilot, 
He introduced me to flying in 1970 when I was 11 years old. He picked me up in San Jose, California in a Piper Cherokee and we flew to Phoenix, Arizona and stopped at Mojave, California for fuel. He let me take the controls for a bit and the seed was planted. My real hero in life was my mom. She soloed and earned her airman certificate in 1944 at the age of 17 when it was extremely rare for a woman to fly. If I've accomplished anything great in life, it's because of her. I write this on November 19th, 2017, which would have been her 91st birthday. Love and miss you, Mom.